were infected. And what we're going to do is expand on that. We've been busy for the last few years sampling, and this is just a kind of a couple of maps showing some of the areas we've been sampling just in the Santa Clara, San Mateo, um, Alameda areas. Some of these areas are sampled rather intensively, like this uh, site where there, there was a restoration planting. We also have some areas we've been sampling more recently where there's, we, these are native sites without restoration plantings. These tend to be more extensive samplings where we're looking at background levels of infestation. Ah. Um, so some of the types of things, uh, Suzanne already mentioned P. tentaculata. We originally found the first detection in, in, in Artemisia, which was in mugwort, was found uh, through some of the sampling we did in one of our sites. This is another one where, again, tentaculata is seen in these plants. They're not dead yet, but they're not doing well either. But we have persistence in the field of this, of this species over time. Um, Phytophthora tentaculata was an issue partly because it was on this top five list. It was number five on the top five list of bad Phytophthora in a way that were identified that uh, USDA didn't want to see in the US. Well, Corsina was number one on that list. We also detected that. And the kicker on that is that these plants were put in 14 years ago. Um, these plants are also not dead yet, but a 14-year-old Corcus globata should be a lot bigger than these are. So you can see there's extreme stunting that's going on associated with that. Talking about the diversity, we're also worried about sites like this where we have plantings close to existing vegetation, so the chance for spread is very real. Just three plants sampled in this little area, we had these uh, four species of Phytophthora, including the last one is Taxon agrifolia. That's an unidentified species. Okay? That's non-described species, so a novel to science. Um, we also have seen unusual situations. Suzanne mentioned we found detections on monocots, uh, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, but we also found situations like this where we have a very saline situation. This is pickleweed, uh, restored marsh, and, uh, and Heather from Dave Rizzo's lab actually baited out these phytophthora from pickleweed sections. So um, we thought we were safe in some, some of the more saline areas, but phytophthora do have a range of salinity tolerance, and even in a site like this, we have issues. We also took the show on the road to Southern California. We didn't want them to be left out, so we did some testing of various types of things down there. This is a set of, uh, of toyons. They look pretty good, I think, a little windblown, but they detected positive for Phytophthora cactuarum, and in just a quick little couple of days of sampling out there in four nurseries, we had both field and nursery detections of a number of different Phytophthora species, including field sites like this, uh, exceptionally dry sites being sampled late in the season. Um, here we have, a, again, a, a taxon, a phytophthora that appears to be new um, and definitely causing these plants to go down as, as they're, uh, after they've been planted in these sites. But you can see there's a very dry site and phytophthora. We think of wet situations, not necessarily so. Here's another one of those sites. It's a desert edge site um, where, again, another either new species or hybrid was, was detected, and that was associated with this uh, Eridictian crassifolia, as well as Phytophthora nicotiani, uh, which seems to be kind of common down there. So the, sad, so the saddest is that amongst multiple products, we had multiple projects, and, and Tyler will talk about this more, we have at least 60 Phytophthora species that are in circulation out there. Um, many of these are, or not most, many, but we have a number of undescribed species that have shown up. So these are the first detections er anywhere. Um, as Suzanne noted, we have more than 50 native species. We know, know that we can find them in northern and southern California sites, and uh, the conditions are wet to dry. So it's not just one sort of situation. We also know a little more about survival. Um, we have sampled sites where plants have been removed and still, and for extended periods of time, up to a year or more, and are still detecting, actually up to multiple years, but we're still detecting some of these Phytophthora species in those things. So a straight host-free period is a very slow decay on these things. You, they, where they will stick around for a while, so replanting or root, root, root in growth to those areas is an issue. Um, 
solarization is one of the things that we're, have been attempted in a number of areas. Um, one thing we know from this is that we need to hit critical temperatures. And from these temperature traces, what we see is that um, if we don't get over 35 C um, in the soil for an extended period of time, like at least 100 hours, uh, we're probably not getting much kill. So uh, this pine plot here is one where we're not really seeing much in the way of, we're, we're seeing some failures, but whereas in these other ones, LS, US, we're getting very good control of cactorum. Uh, we've also been sampling to look, in some situations, look at spread from these, these nursery plants. So we're looking out at from, from known positives and looking out what's found around them. And we have seen spread. Um, most commonly, it's showing up in areas where we have things like you see here, trees nearby where there's roots extending into those planting sites. So there's a natural bridge for infection to occur and spread outward. Um, there are some water samples taken here too, which uh, these blue arrows. And we have been working a little bit on water sampling. Um, a couple of interesting things, Tyler will probably expand on this more. Talk about these clade six phytophthoras. Um, these are water specialists. And we're talking about stable water sources like reservoirs or perennial streams or whatnot that are floating, that are not receiving runoff. Almost exclusively we're finding clade six species. Um, however, some of these terrestrial root pathogens are circulating in the water when we have runoff or flooding events. So if we have a ponded area from, from rains like we've had this last winter, or uh, this river which is just down the street here, um, and it actually runs past the center on this side, we were picking up uh, under flood flow conditions um, other of these soil-borne phytophthoras that cause root rots. So they can circulate in the ground in those situations. This table, um, is more than you want to look at right now, but the bottom line, if you look at the blue tinted fields, those are all detections in water. You'll see that there's some overlap. There's some things that only show up in water so far. There's things that we found in both transplants, associated vegetation, and a few species showing up only so far in, uh, in, uh, in uh, soil. Um, Phytophthora cambivora is kind of highlighted here because we've been finding a number of places on the peninsula where there are some widespread infestations. Uh, this is one on, on mid-pen properties, uh, probably associated with the uh, Christmas tree plantings historically in this area. We've also been sampling in some wildland areas where uh, there are no obvious, there's no plantings, but there's disturbances, there's cattle grazing, there's roads, there's trails. And the bottom line is we're not finding phytophthora in these places. Um, all these pins you see here are negatives. The two pink ones there, which are positives, are associated with ponds. And these are spring-fed ponds, so they're not getting runoff from anywhere else. And what they have in there are clade six species, which are probably being brought in by sources like cattle moving from one property to another. And these clade six species seem to get moved around very readily that way. This slide sort of summarizes kind of an example of what we got widespread um, sampling in this area. All these white dots are, are negatives. All the reds are positives. You see this cluster down here, which is actually associated with a, a historical nursery planting in this area. If we look at the Phytophthora composition, we see a mixed Phytophthora infestation in this site. Many of these sites have two species of Phytophthora associated with them. These water detections out there are just clade six species along by the dam and along the river. So we have been working with uh, a number of people on, on developing BMPs, and we see them being employed in the nursery. Um, one of the issues in those is getting proper testing, and we've been working on this technique of bench effluent testing. Um, some people have been applying this already, which is very good. Um, we, we have some things to optimize this technique. We hope that people will understand how these, this works properly so they're getting the most bang for their buck on out there, but it, based off the fact that those spores swim up and we're concentrating them in these areas. And later on, we, we pull a sample to have additional incubation. We find that both of these two uh, phases, you get some infection. And of course, you get your infected pairs to tell you what's going on. We are not doing sensitivity testing on that, uh, where you can see the one, the one uh, pot here, which is an infested pot against a bunch of clean pots that have 
uh, just grass growing in them in clean soil. Um, the last thing I'm just going to mention is it came up in the overview is the idea of risk-based BMPs. We're working in the field. We can't act. We have to still be able to work in the field. So we're looking at ways that we can minimize the impacts of, of what, what we have to do to, to minimize spread. And these are the factors that involve how much inoculum is in the site, how much are we moving, and how receptive is the site. And what we get is some risk models that look like this. If a site is very receptive, we can't very move much infected material without having a high risk of, of infecting that site. But if we have a low receptive site, not very many hosts that are possibly infected, we have a lot more latitude. And so that's, we can possibly concentrate our efforts more on those higher risk areas and, and ration our use of our BMP. So I just want to end it with that slide. A lot of people and entities that are involved in this work. Thanks a lot.